developers, real estate, industry, government, and home owners. We will talk about main contractors. Uh, then we will then look into the subcontractors, specialist contractors, and trade subcontractors. We will define all these subcontractors as we move along. Uh, we also have a very large equipment and machinery hire sector within the construction. And these are the companies that will rent you the excavators, the cranes, the concrete pumps, and all the other equipment that most construction companies need, but they do not own. So it's very different here in Australia. Uh, we may, if we have plenty, if we have some time, we'll talk about finance. We'll talk about the role of government and the role of government as number one, as a client and also as a regulator. And, and my perspective, when I talk about construction economics, my perspective is always coming in from a, from an, from a market oriented perspective. So looking at why construction companies, whether they're making money, whether they are innovating and the reasons for them to innovate. And that's usually driven by market factors such as competition and making profits. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So it's, I think we've discussed this uh, last week, we talked about the role of construction within the national economy. So the demand for and the supply of construction is always influenced by a variety of factors including interest rates, uh, tax changes, changes in population. And I believe that uh, in Indonesia, you would also have the government policy of investing heavily in infrastructure to improve quality of life. Whereas over here in Australia, the investments in building or residential homes is clearly driven by population. When we have uh, more inward migration into Australia, the number of homes or the demand for homes go up, all right? The construction industry and its activities are strongly linked to other sectors of the economy, not necessarily the Australian economy, but it also includes uh, every other country around the world. It's, there are lots of links to other sectors of the economy and that's quite clear, such as manufacturing, wholesale trade, retail trade, finance and insurance. Uh, the industries such as pop property, real estate, architecture and engineering are very closely linked to the construction industry, even though they are not considered part of the construction industry. So let's look at the construction industry through these uh, three broad areas of activity, residential buildings, non-residential buildings and engineering construction. So residential buildings, like I've mentioned last week, is uh, the construction of houses and flats or apartments. Uh, I'm not sure what, what you call them in Indonesia. I think you call them apartments and non-residential buildings. So these are offices, commercial buildings, shopping malls, hotels, uh, hospitals, prisons, police stations, schools, and all those other buildings. Then there's engineering construction, which are the roads, bridges, railway, uh, water treatment plants, sewers, mining, and uh, all the other projects that you see in around your cities, right? Now, to, to ensure that we are able to compare uh, the construction sector across different countries, we, we have what we call the Australia and New Zealand standard industrial classification. So this is, uh, you, you, you may know that Australia and New Zealand are very close as two uh, very close partners. Uh, we, we consider New Zealand almost like another state within Australia. So a lot of our standards and codes are shared with New Zealand. So we have what we call an Australian and New Zealand standards. Uh, and we use this same industrial classification for the or how we describe our economy right so division e is what we call construction so construction by definition includes the construction of buildings uh, which includes on site assembly and erection of prefabricated buildings so the most important thing you need to to understand down here is this word here on site assembly and erection 
Okay, so it's mainly to do with work that is carried out at a construction site uh, for buildings, then roads, railway, airports, irrigation projects, everything that you can think of. So it includes, all right, so this is the important bit. It includes businesses or what you call badan usaha, mainly engaged uh, in the repair of buildings and other structures, engages in the alteration or renovation of buildings. So if you have repair and maintenance, companies that are involved in repair of structures are included as part of construction, all right? It does not, okay, so what does it not include? It does not include companies providing architectural supervision or consultant engineering services. So your architects, your design engineers, your quantity surveyors are not included in construction. So this is the Australian definition, okay? And what is interesting is that uh, defense forces, whatever the defense force builds, for example, defense housing, defense infrastructure is not part of construction. So this is something peculiar, right? Uh, whatever the defense industry or the defense sector builds is considered defense. It is not considered construction. Installations activities. So units engage in installation activities such, such as installation of heating and air conditioning equipment is fire alarm system. Uh, electrical wiring, all those are included as construction. So subcontractors for building services and your electrical contractor is included as construction. Specialist services or special building or construction trade services. So this would include your concreting, uh, structural steel erection, okay? Structural steel erection. So this is the critical difference. Structural steel erection. The manufacturing of your structural steel is not construction, but the structural steel erection is construction. So carpentry, bricklaying, concreting, plumbing, painting, plastering, floor and wall tiling, roof tiles, uh, putting in the carpets, all that is part of construction trade services. So those are considered part of construction. What it does not include, now this is another funny one. If you install a washing machine in a new building, that is included as construction. But if you have an existing house and you buy a new washing machine, the installation of the washing machine is not construction, okay? So only uh, built-in furniture when the building is new is considered construction, but after the building is complete, uh, that's no longer con considered as construction. It will then be considered under retail or manufacturing. So that's quite a uh, something that you have to be aware of. I'm not sure how it works in Indonesia, so you may need to check uh, whether your Indonesian industrial classification covers or goes into such detail. Okay, so once, once we've done that, uh, we can very clearly break down the construction sector into building, uh, heavy civil engineering, and construction services. So these are our breakdowns. Residential will be divided into house construction. Remember what I said last week about house? A house is defined as a single detached house on, uh, on a separate piece of land. So you cannot have another house attached to it. A house is defined as a detached house. Then 3019 is other residential buildings. So that could mean uh, a terraced house, a semi-detached house, a dual occupancy, or all the way until apartment blocks. Then non-residential building would be 
uh, all the other buildings that are not houses or apartments. So that would mean schools, uh, uh, schools, hospitals, prisons, and all those things. Okay. Then you have your civil engineering, which is roads and bridges, and you have other heavy civil engineering construction that's uh, pretty common. Then your construction services, that's land development and site preparation. So that's basically ground clearing. Then you have your structural services, you have your building installation services, building completion services, and other construction services. So the reason we do all this is to, number one, allow us to compare between Australia and New Zealand, and also to compare with the rest of the world. Okay, so let's, let's talk about house construction. The, okay, so like, like I've mentioned last week, house construction is as shown in that picture over here on the right hand side, it is to build a single detached house. It is standalone. There are no other buildings attached to it. And it includes uh, the construction of the house. It also includes alterations additions or renovations to houses. And it includes all the activities of uh, organizing or managing these activities, all right? So it can be the builder or the project manager or construction manager managing the activities of building a house. And the primary activities will be clearly house construction, but because the house or rather all most houses in Australia comes with a garage, so this, is, this includes garage construction, it includes the house, it also includes the prefabrication, assembly, erection, and installation. But that is limited to everything that's done on site. All right. So it is always the activities on site that is counted as construction activities. Anything that is not on site is not counted as construction. So these are the exclusions of site production of prefabricated building is not considered under 3011. That goes into structural metal product manufacturing. So if you are building uh, either a timber roof or a steel roof truss, that goes into manufacturing. Uh, if you are providing repair services, such as electrical or plumbing repairs, that goes into uh, building installation services, but some of these are still construction, right? That is starts with a number three. So that is still under construction, but it's not house construction, but services. Like I've mentioned previously, architectural or building consultancy services are in technical services. That is not part of construction. Other residential buildings, now, so this is this is quite an interesting one where, where you have two houses side by side. So this is one house called A, and this is another house, B. All right, so these are two houses. This is A and that's B, and they have a common wall over here. So this is a shared wall. And that is considered what we call, this is what we call a dual occupancy. So this is no longer considered a house. This will be other residential buildings. All right, so these are for uh, <clears throat> what we call residential buildings, except for freestanding houses. It also includes additions, alterations, and renovations. Uh, it will be activities that in Included in 3019 will be apartment construction, duplex house construction, flat construction, high rise construction, or the renovation and alterations to residential buildings. So that's 3019. Again, the exclusions are the same as the previous slide, so I don't have to go through them. Non residential buildings. This is a continuation, right? Uh, no, this is 3020, non-residential building. So this is uh, buildings where you cannot reside. So it's not a house, it's not an apartment. So this will be hotels, hot, hostels, hospitals, prisons, uh, schools, and all these other buildings. 
So it would include commercial buildings, which will be your shopping malls, office blocks, and uh, it could also include industrial buildings like warehouses and uh, factories. Okay. Industry structure and performance. So now that we've seen that the companies can be builders uh, building residential, builders building non-residential, and builders doing infrastructure work, let's look at the number of construction companies, okay? Now, if you look, these are, uh, these are a bit old. This is 2010, 2011 values. And if you look at the number of businesses in Australia, at that time, there were 2 million businesses, okay? There were 2 million businesses. Out of 2 million businesses, 350,000 of these businesses are in construction. Now, if you look down the list, this is clearly number one. Okay, we have the largest number of construct of businesses and companies operating in Australia. Okay, 350,000 out of 2 million are construction businesses. So we have the largest number of business entities. So this would include businesses and companies. Now, unfortunately, if you look at entry and exit, so these are the number of companies started during that financial year. And these are the number of companies that closes during that financial year. Entry and exit. Now, if you look at those numbers again, what do you see? Very high. Okay. It is very high. So if we have 350,000 companies in that year, we have an additional 52,000 new companies joining the industry. And we have 51,000 companies exiting the industry. Why? Now, this is, this is a good time for you guys to, to, to speak to me. Do you, do you see the same problem in Indonesia? And why do you think there are so many companies coming in and so many companies going out? What do you think? Anyone? Anyone want to say anything? Maybe, maybe me, but yes, but one. Okay, yeah. Uh, I just thinking of uh, maybe it's very easy to to uh, create new company in. Australia, mm. maybe the the regulation is government support to new company to develop new company. Permit is very easy, I think, and the bureaucracy is not not so hard in Indonesia. So uh, to uh, set up new company is uh, very easy, but in other side, I think the competition in Australia is very high. So that company that not effective and that have no skill level or something like that, they will get loose and they cannot uh, continue in this, their operation. Just thinking like that. Correct. It, correct. It, it, what you say is very accurate. But the question is, why do they continue to set up so many new companies when you see so many companies fail? Why do they continue setting up companies when it is the highest rate of failure? Mm. It's very strange, right? <laughs> yes, maybe. I think 
construction is industry that uh, like low end low entry barrier so entry it's barrier. very easy to very easy yeah. to start up a company it's com- yeah yes but but it's they- different with uh, maybe manufacturer or something like that hmm. yes yes it's it you are very accurate in your description of the industry but because there are many companies coming in and many companies exiting the construction industry we see a lot of problems because many of them do not have the experience many of them do not have the track record many of them are what we call cowboy all right they they are not really in the construction industry to deliver a good product or to deliver good service they are there uh to to make money and if they cannot make money they run away so that is a very bad uh consequence of the low barriers to entry what about indonesia do you have the same problems I think same yeah. <laughs> I think same yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. So so Because I think it's very universal, right? This problem is universal. It's very easy to join and very easy to go bankrupt. Yeah. Any other comments from the other students? Anyone else? Uh, okay, this is uh, information on productivity. Uh, if you look at productivity, the reg- the common argument is that construction productivity is not very high. Uh, we can talk about productivity in great detail if you want to, but generally the multi-factor productivity for construction is uh, sometimes driven by economic growth. So it's it. It's not really accurate because during periods of economic growth, multi-factor productivity seems to be very high. And when there is uh, economic recession, multi-factor productivity comes down. So my advice to you is don't just look at uh, productivity on its own. You also have to look at productivity, uh, the reasons behind the productivity increase and the reasons behind productivity Uh, declines now in in australia as a whole during that entire period of uh, 2000 to 2010 there was no not much economic growth because whatever growth in the first five years was cancelled out in the next five years and this is mainly because of the global financial crisis in 2008 but uh it's quite strange that construction managed to report a positive 2.3% productivity growth uh but I, i i can talk a little bit more about that if you guys are interested at the end of the lecture right so let's let's move on for now okay so what we're trying to say with this uh slide is that a lot of the construction output becomes investment for the country so this is what we call gross fixed capital formation gfcf that basically increases the net value of the assets of the country so if you build a new house the value of the house is captured as an investment so if you look over here this are that's the financial year this is what we call financial year 2014 2015 this is uh first quarter of the financial year but this is actually quarter 3 of 2015 quarter 4 of 2015 uh, sorry 2014 then this is quarter 1 of 2015 quarter 2 of 2015 so if you add up those four quarters you get your annual values uh these are the values for investments in housing these are the values for investments in non residential buildings all right so if you add those two if you add 22 plus 31 
you end up with an investment of 54 billion. So these are in billion dollars, billion Australian dollars. Uh, sorry, if I put, no, no, this is not billion, this is million because this is 22,000 million. All right. Now, if I then look at what other investments, so the money that you earn as your salary, you can either buy food, which is what we call consumption, or you can invest in a house, which we call investments. So in terms of total investment, for that quarter, the total investment is 89.9, oh, sorry, 89.8 billion, but 60% is from construction. So you can tell that the contribution of the construction industry into your national assets is very, very high. And the only other investment is in machinery and equipment. So that's 18 billion and uh, intellectual property. So this is a relatively new concept where intellectual property is also considered an asset for a country. But the most, the largest asset that a country actually accumulates is always the outputs of construction. So we built houses, that is an investment. We built uh, factories, we built uh, commercial buildings, we built hospitals, we built schools, we built railways, we built roads. So all those are what we consider as investments and construction contributes 60% of Australian investments, okay? So that's why we keep saying that it is very important to have a very strong and uh, effective construction industry because ev almost all the output of the construction sector goes towards investments. And the better quality of your investments, uh, the better returns you get from uh, better value you get from all these investments in construction. Okay, so now let's let's talk about why we separate design and production in the construction industry. Okay, so if you look at the different participants or different actors <clears throat> in the construction industry, you realize that there is a half that is doing the design work, which are the architects, the civil engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. Uh, we also have quantity surveyors, urban planners, uh, environmental consultants, and all the other consultants working in the design part of the business. You then have the production side, which is the mm -hmm. middle mm -hmm. section where you have your main contractor, subcontractor, trade contractors, specialist contractors, and equipment rental. Uh, in Australia, most of the equipment are rented. The contractors do not normally own their excavators, their cranes, or the heavy equipment. Most of those equipment are rented from equipment hire companies. And you have others who, are, who may not be in the construction industry, but they are supplying to the subcontractors or to the contractors. So these are your material suppliers, uh, steel sections, reinforcing bars, timber, uh, concrete. So these are material suppliers. You also have your fabricators and prefabricators. And increasingly, you have imports coming in. So in Australia, we import a lot of our construction materials. I'm not sure how much you import into Indonesia, but I believe it is less than what we do. So let's, let's have a quick look at how design and production is separated in these three different market segments. I'm gonna very quickly examine uh, residential home builder, commercial projects and infrastructure projects. So I will give you one example of each of these sectors. So the first picture over here is uh, clearly a residential home. So this is a double story residential house built by a residential home builder. Uh, we call them builders rather than contractors because they are constructing buildings. 
You then have a commercial builder that will build commercial buildings. So that's, uh, I think that's an apartment building, which is something like 80 stories. So those are most of the modern apartments in the city are all these tall apartment buildings today. And picture on the right is a project that is currently ongoing, which, which is what we call the Westgate Tunnel uh, in Melbourne, which goes under the river. So that's an infrastructure project. Okay, <clears throat> let's have a quick look at uh, home builder. So I'm giving you an example of Mervac, which is a home builder and developer. They started off in 1972 as a small builder, but they're now very large and they are listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. They uh, built homes, okay? So this is the an example, is this ground floor plan? So you can have a look at the pictures in, on their website. So if you just uh, type in Mervac Homes in Google, you should be able to see a picture of uh, a finished house or a render of a finished house. You get to see the floor plans and you get to see the plans for the upper level. So this is a two-story two, two house. And how do you think you buy a house in Australia? Now, how, how does it work in Indonesia? Tell me. Tell me how you buy a house in Indonesia. Then I will tell you how we buy a house in Australia. How do you think it works? We Anyone? buy it from developer. You buy from developer, yes. So the, the house will be, can you choose what type of house, what design you want? Yes. I mean, based on the, uh, the developer's uh, design. Normally they have design? cluster of design, cluster okay. of type of house. So mm -hmm. they, we can choose uh, based on our budget and preference. So it comes with house and land. So you buy the house and buy the land at the same time, or do you buy them separately? Uh, it depends. Uh, not, uh, some developers, they can uh, sell a lot of, I mean, a lot uh, of land, a piece of land in within their cluster. Mm -hmm. But And you uh, choose what house you want to buy. And we can also buy... Uh, a lot with uh, already uh, uh, a built house there. Okay. okay, that's very good. Now, in in Australia, the developer only we don't have housing developers. We have land developers. So the land developer will clear the land, divide the land into plots and sell the land to individual owners. So when an owner buys the land, they will then need to look for a builder to build them a house. So they will engage a company like this, Mervac, who is a home builder, and they will have a catalog of houses that they can build for you. So again, depending on your budget and depending on your land size, uh, you can choose what type of house you want and the builder will build it for you, uh, sign a contract, agree to build it for you over a fixed period of uh, maybe 10 months or 12 months. And at the end of that period, you pay the money and you get a house. Okay, so that's how it works in, in Australia. Now, the next question is, how do you become a builder and what does the builder do? So this is where we start getting into the uh, definition of construction. A builder for a residential house. So this is a picture of a residential house, the structure of the residential house. Most of our houses are built out of timber. So even though you may see or you may think that it is a brick house, the structure of the house is made out of timber. Uh, <clears throat> 
most of the people who work as a builder or, or register themselves as builder would need to have a professional qualification. So that could be a certificate for a diploma, a bachelor's degree, or a master's degree in building and construction. So those are the qualifications that will allow them to become a builder. Uh, <clears throat> many of them come from carpentry as a trade. So they may have started their career as a carpenter and over time, they improve themselves and complete a certificate for to become a builder. Can you see why many carpenters become builders? Yeah, it's the main component of the building. It's the main component of the house, yes, yes, because the structure of the house is always timber, all right? So if they are newly registered, they will be registered first as a home builder because residential houses are the easiest to build. So it's usually the carpenter who, after working about five years, goes back to school and gets a builder qualification and they will then start to build residential homes. So now my question to you guys is this, who does the architectural design? Who works out the loads and structural analysis? Uh, who checks that it complies with the building codes? Who decides on the size of the structural members and who manages the projects? What do you think? Who does the architectural design? Come on, let's talk about this. Who do you think does the architectural design? Yeah, they're a company, I think. Uh, you think it's a company? You think it's uh, the, the residential builder, the Mervac? Actually, you don't need to have an architect. So it's, it's quite an interesting way of construction here in Australia, where the builder can design without having an architectural qualification. So for residential homes, there is no requirement to have an architect. So you and I can sketch, can produce a drawing and the builder can actually build it if the builder thinks that the structure is safe. So there is no need for an architect. Okay, second question, who works out the loads and does the structural analysis? The Many of us are civil oh, engineers. But one, sorry, what did you say? Yes, the builder also, I think. Yes, it's the builder. So the builder is a, is, a, is a special qualification between... So they, they can almost do the work of an, engine, of an engineer. So these are very simple design calculations. They will be able to work out the loads. They will be able to do simple structural analysis for a house. So a house is then defined as either one or two stories, okay? So as long as the house is a standalone house, the builder is able to work out the loads, able to work out the structural analysis. They will also have to comply with building codes. So the builders are also trained to understand building codes and apply the requirements of the building codes. They will choose the member sizes, right? Sizing of structural members is also done by the builder. The builder manages the project. So that's where the home builder comes in. Okay. Now, what so, does the builder, yes? Uh, how about the compliance with building codes who ensure the, that the builder comply with the building code? Okay, so there is another profession called building surveyor. 
and the builder has to engage an independent building surveyor to check that the building complies with building codes. Okay. So it's include uh, in their budget, I mean, their proposed budget mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. owner. Yes. So the builder will price everything. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Including the cost of compliance. Now, my question to you, what does the builder not do? And what is the difference between the role of an engineer and the role of a builder? So many of you have a, a S1 degree in civil engineering. And with a civil engineering degree, some of you can work in uh, construction uh, in, in construction companies or in consulting companies doing design. In Australia, most of the engineers only work in design. They do not work in construction because we have another profession called builders. So the builders are the one who builds, the engineers are the one who designs. So there is a very clear divide between who designed and who built. All right. So if you are in the engineering school, they will only be taught how to design. And if you are in the building school, you will only be taught how to build. But the building course will include some concepts of uh, engineering design, structural analysis, how to work out the loads, how to work out the bending moments, and how to choose structural members. Uh, what the builder does not do is the subcontractor's work. So if you look at this house, uh, very often the builder is also the carpenter because that is the main structural component. The builder will engage a subcontractor for plumbing, they will engage a subcontractor for electrical work. They will engage a subcontractor for brick laying, for roof, uh, for flooring, the floor covering. So either tiles or carpet. They will also engage another subcontractor for walls. So many of those uh, trades are subcontracted out. So the builder generally only does project management or uh, carpentry work. So the roles and responsibilities, builder manages the project, uh, builder provides the layout and design of the building. They will be supervising the subcontractors, coordinating the work of subcontractors, uh, and also organize for supplies of building materials. There is another builder, Potter Davis Homes. If you wish to have a look, uh, click on that link. And that gives you a 360 degree view of some of the houses. Now, what I'm going to show you is just a very simple uh, YouTube video. So I'll just click on this. It's one minute, 18 seconds. There's no audio in the video, so I can uh, describe what's going on. So this is just a demonstration house that uh, Mervac does and they use this as marketing material. So if you look at the walls, the windows, the floor finishes, that's what will be uh, included in the contract price. The furniture is not included, okay? Only the hard and permanent fixtures are included. The fridge will not be included. Uh, the furniture is not included. So that's typically an Australian house. That's the bedroom upstairs. 
Then you walk into the wardrobe. Ladies will love this. There's plenty of uh, cupboard space for clothes and shoes. Then the bathroom, his and hers wash basins, shower and bath. Okay, now if I say, go back over here, can you tell that this is a timber house? So what do you think the walls are made of? The main structural system is timber. So the walls are all timber stud walls. So it's wooden posts and uh, gypsum boards uh, nailed onto the timber posts. All right, and it's it's very nicely painted, but it is uh, hollow. So if you tap on it, you can hear that it is hollow, just like my walls in my study over here. So if I knock on the wall, you can hear that it's uh, it's a hollow sound. Uh, many of your buildings in Indonesia are all made of brick. So th that is the huge difference or a clear difference between our buildings and your buildings. Okay, commercial builder. So this is another type of uh, construction company where they build commercial buildings. Again, they have to be registered and very often they start off the registration as a home builder and uh, progress over the years to become a commercial builder. And again, uh, this is where we start talking about procurement methods. Uh, many of you will have looked at procurement methods in your undergraduate degree, where there is a clear divide between design and construction. There's also a clear uh, divide because you have to complete the design before you construct. So in the traditional procurement process, you finished, the architects will finish the design together with the engineers, produce all the drawings, uh, send those drawings out for tender, which is what we call the bid process. At the end of the bidding process, you choose a contractor, award the building contract, and then the contractor will start construction. These days, the construction production system is beginning to overlap. So we now have uh, procurement methods where it's design and build. So the contractor now assumes responsibility for design, design development, documentation, and construction. That's very common to, uh, to you in Indonesia as well, I believe. So you can also have design and build where the main contractor takes over the responsibility for the design and the architect works for the main contractor. Now, we in Australia have what we call a novated contract, which is a very funny way of construction where the architect is initially appointed by the client. So if you want uh, to develop an apartment block, you engage the architect in the first instance. So you tell the architect that I want uh, an 80 story building, uh, three apartments of four apartments per floor. Uh, this is how, the, how much the land is gonna cost. If I build 80 stories, three apartments per floor, this is the amount of money I can sell the apartments for. I should be able to uh, sell the project for this amount of money and earn that amount of profit. Now, once the design or preliminary design has been completed by the architects, they will then take the preliminary set of drawings and start to ask mm -hmm. for bids. They go out to tender with a preliminary set of drawings. When the contractor is appointed, they will then ask the architect to then work for the contractor. So this is what we mean by novated contracts. The original contract for the design, which was between the architect and the client is novated to the contractor. So the architect now works for the contractor. Uh, do you see how that works? Questions? 
What do you think? What do you guys think of this system? Have you heard of this system? Have you tried this system in Indonesia? It's like a design and build system. I think it's, it's not design and build. Design and build is where the contractor has full control at the start that they will be doing design and build. This is, it's this one novated contract is when they start off with the client engaging the architect but when the con when after they finish pre preliminary design they novate the contract to the builder so the architect then works for the builder and the builder yes. then takes full design responsibility yes because the Preliminary design is this is like requirement design, mm. isn't it? Yes. It's not yes. not detailed design. It's not detailed design. Yes, it is not detailed design. Uh, it is only a preliminary design enough to capture most of the important aspects of the architectural intent. So maybe yes. the outline of the building is there. You have divided it into uh, maybe four apartments per, per floor, there is enough information for them to sell the buildings, uh, to sell the apartments, and enough information for the builder to estimate a price. Yes. But once because, yeah. the builder is appointed, then the architect works for the builder. Yeah, because the, the responsibility of design is by contractor, right? By contractor, yes. That's why in this, uh, like uh, design and build. Yes, okay. it will, at the yes. end of the day, the responsibility will be similar to design and build. Yeah. Yep, the responsibility will be with the builder, with the contractor. But it's, it's just moving in a slightly different way because at the start, the client engages the architect. Mm. So this is a very common method of, uh, of uh, construction for commercial buildings. And uh, even the building that I am working in, the, the architecture building at the University of Melbourne was procured using this method. There was a design competition. The architecture firms competed. They, the winning firm commenced the design. And after preliminary design was done, they use the preliminary design to ask contractors to bid. And once they've decided on the winning bid, the winning contractor then took over the contract. So that's, uh, that's how we divide the design and construction responsibilities generally for commercial buildings. Uh, some of you who have attended my other talks will have uh, be able to recognize this in the design team, uh, it has become so specialized that the design team can include up to 50 consultants for a complex building. So most of us will think that you need an architect, a civil engineer, a structural engineer, a mechanical engineer to look after the lifts, uh, an electrical engineer to look after the uh, lighting and all the air conditioning system. But over here, it has become very complex. Uh, we have consultants who are looking after acoustics, services, landscape, heritage, <coughs> waste, sustainable. Uh, for high-rise building, you have wind. You also need traffic engineers, you need fire services engineers, you need geotechnical engineers, you have facade engineers, you have facade access consultants, you have overshadowing consultants, you have aviation consultants because if it's a tall building, uh, you need to ensure that it doesn't interfere with a flight path. Uh, the, the, over the last 10 years, we've even seen wayfinding consultants like if you walk into an airport, there are signs to tell you where to go. So these are, again, 
they have consultants to tell you how and where to put those signs. So that's called a wayfinding consultant. Uh, we've got lots and lots of consultants. So you can imagine that the cost of uh, designing and building these structures are going to be very, very expensive. I have a question, Pat. Okay. Yes. Can the contractor change the architect after elected? Uh, usually, no. No. Usually, no. But they have been uh, known to change from an expensive architect to a cheap architect because they get a, a, a big brand name architect to design the shape of the building. You attract buyers. And then when the contractor, when the contract is then novated to the builder, the builder looks for a cheap architect who will listen to them. Can you, you, you can tell, right? The, the difference between an architect working for a client versus an architect working for a contractor. The architect working for the contractor will be pressured to use lower quality materials the architect working for the client will be controlling quality because they are working for the client. So there's always this tension. If the architect works for the client, the architect will specify very high quality materials. If the architect is working for the contractor, the contractor will say, hello, architect, you are my friend. I am paying your <laughs> fees. Can you please change to a lower quality material because then both of them can make more profits. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's you, you've worked for a contractor, so you know the problems. Who is the control uh, in, in a client side? Do they, does they have a like construction management to control the construction? Uh, yes and no. So it depends on whether the client have the capacity to control. Many mm -hmm. clients are not able to control. So if you, it, it depends. If you are a regular developer, then they will have in-house project management teams and they will know how to control. But if you are a government agency, uh, building only one project every 20 years, then you may not have the skills to control. So they may need to engage a project management firm to help them manage those projects. Okay. So, okay. okay. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask you about the, the philosophy or uh, the reason why the NOFET, uh, why the NOFET contract is used in Australia. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if the ar architect uh, initially appointed by the client, mm -hmm. and there are there is a, a selection uh, stage to select the contractor, if the architect will be later on include in the uh, uh, the winning contractor, so there will be a conflict of interest for the architect to, when they're selecting the contractor. No, uh, the architect will not be involved in the selection of contractor because the oh, selection okay. of contractor will be done by the client. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, it, it is... Uh, I mean, it, it, it is uh, interesting uh, because uh, normally in, in Indonesia, uh, the architect, uh, some of their scope is producing the uh, basic design, but mm. normally the basic design will be, uh, later on will be uh, detailed by uh, uh, detail engineering design uh, within the design build contract or EPC contract. Uh, but I, I think I, I got some some uh, idea because the architect uh, the architect will be the same architect will be uh, very familiar with their basic design because they are, it's their pro it is their product, product. 
Yeah. Correct. The reason for using novated contract is because they want a single point of responsibility because of the divide between design and construction. So if something were to go wrong with the building, the client doesn't know who is responsible. Is it a design problem or a construction problem? So by having novated contracts, they can very clearly determine that if there are any problems with the building, they go to the contractor. Right? Okay, yes. Uh, if you remember, I spoke about the fire in La Crosse building in Melbourne. So there was uh, cladding that caught fire and the clients sued the builder. Okay, the client sues the builder. And it's quite easy because you know that you just sue the builder and the builder will then have to go and sort it out with the architect, with the building surveyor, with the fire engineer, who is responsible. Because from the client's perspective, you want one, one person responsible. And it's a lot easier that way. So that's, that's commercial projects today. Most commercial projects are delivered this way. Okay, infrastructure projects. Uh, this, gets, <laughs> this gets really complex. Uh, most infrastructure projects are expensive, are complex, and would be delivered by a consortium of contractors, designers, and financiers. Uh, we have most of our large projects are PPPs or competitive alliance. So the client is usually the government. So in this particular case, uh, we're looking at the Metro Tunnel Project. Uh, if you look very carefully, those of you who have been to Melbourne, uh, we have a city loop. So our train system goes in a loop. It goes in a circle. It goes round and round. The university is uh, here, Parkville. This is where the university is. But Wawan used to be at uh, RMIT, right? So RMIT is next door near Melbourne Central or State Library. So that's where RMIT University is. So this is a, an extension uh, and a new line that is going from the blue line. The light blue line is a new line. And that's going from Sunbury and uh, connecting to the Beckenham Cranbourne line. <clears throat> so these are uh, <clears throat> some of the modern procurement methods that we use. Rail Projects Victoria is the Victorian government body that is responsible for the delivery of the Metro Tunnel. And <clears throat> uh, let me just briefly talk you through all the different contracts that were used. And Early Works contract was uh, using a management contracting contract, contract awarded to one particular construction company to do early works. Then the main tunnels are based on PPP. So the tunnels and stations were run on a PPP based on an availability payment for those tunnels and stations. The railway infrastructure was using a competitive alliance and it's all different groups of companies okay so it's not like what you do in indonesia where i've looked at your kereta cepat from jakarta to bandung and you uh, you have a consortium it's one consortium that does everything over here we tend to break up all the projects or break up the single project into many phases and we then have different contracts with different groups of companies so in terms of tunnel, you have the uh, consortium called the Cross Yara Partnership Consortium. So you have Land Lease, John Holland, uh, and a few other construction companies. Uh, for railway infrastructure, it is uh, John Holland, CPB Contractors, and AECOM. So AECOM is the engineering company. Uh, John Holland and CPB are contractors. Then there's construction power. Uh, and on the next slide, you have the railway system, you have your tram infrastructure works, and you have your network enhancement. So all these are let out under different 
contracts and different contract uh, different procurement methods. If you want more details, you can get on to the Metro Tunnel website. The link is given here. Uh, <clears throat> but the unfortunate thing is that uh, in December 2020, which was just two months ago, uh, we learned that the original $11, $11 billion budget has now gone three billion dollars over the original budget so we the the government is now in uh is being sued and suing the project team because of a three billion budget overrun and we think that the government will lose uh, and the taxpayer will have to pick up this three billion dollar extra cost or cost overrun that has occurred with the metro tunnel system. I think this is very common. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of large projects are complex and we don't seem to be able to estimate or predict construction costs very accurately. Even though we have lots of uh, consultants, we have lots of uh, very clever people around. So this is my uh, partly my research and also partly a challenge to you guys to think about why the construction production system is so inefficient, right? If you were to compare that with, say, for example, a car production system, and uh, I got this information from the Ford Motor Company. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is America or in Australia. Now, if you look up the production system for motor cars, and you go onto the Ford website, you will realize that Ford designs the cars, Ford sells the cars, Ford accepts trade-in. So whatever car you are currently driving, Ford will buy that car from you. Ford will also finance your purchase. All right? So Ford, as one company, does almost everything. So they design, they manufacture, they may have suppliers or other subcontractors that supply components, but they are the ones that are in full control of the entire production process. So my, my question to you guys is, uh, why is it that it can be done so well in the manufacturing sector, but poorly in the construction industry, all right? Now, another point which I want to make is uh, when we compare another example in manufacturing, uh, this is a couple of years old now, the iPhone 10. If you look at the iPhone 10 and the total cost of the iPhone 10 versus its manufacturing cost, the manufacturing cost of the iPhone 10 is around $400 while the uh, total selling price of the iPhone 10 is around 1,000 US dollars. So if you then were to break down the manufacturing costs, uh, you can see that the display is the most expensive, then you have other components, blah, 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 and you break it down, you can see that the components, number one, come from all over the world. So this is what we call globalization of manufacturing as well. Uh, many components come from where? Uh, if you look at the list, it's South Korea, Japan, UK, Switzerland, US. Uh, what do you think is the actual manufacturing cost of the iPhone? So if the iPhone 10 is worth 1,000 US dollars, what is the manufacturing cost? of assembling the iPhone? It's 1,000 US dollars to buy. What do you think is the manufacturing cost? So how much money does China make by assembling the iPhone? What do you think? Cheap, yeah. oh, it's very cheap, yes. Uh, if you look at the figure over there, uh, manufacturing cost is only eight US dollars. Okay, eight US dollars. The manufacturing 
cost is eight US dollars. So China's value add in assembling the iPhone is eight US dollars. So which company has captured the most of the value add? Who do you think has captured the most value add? Samsung. Sorry. Samsung. 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 Yeah. Samsung. I don't think so. Look. Look this at the South Korea. South Korea. <clears throat> it's over here. Oh, Apple. Yeah. <laughs> Apple. Okay. Yeah. So Apple. Because they are in control of the manufacturing process and sales and marketing, captures sixty percent of the value. Whereas the Chinese company that assembles the phone, basic manufacturing cost is only eight dollars, and that goes to China. All right. Now, if you look at this, what, how, how does this compare with construction? How much money does the, the client make? How much money does the contractor make? And how much money does the uh, subcontractors and suppliers make? So, where do you see construction companies? Is the construction company up here, or is the construction company down here? Yes. Are they at A, or are they at B? B. B. <laughs> Only four percent. Yes. Yes, it's very very small. All right. The construction company's profits are very very small because we are only involved in the assembly process. We are not involved in creating value. Okay, so if you look at, if you compare it with Apple, it, it becomes very, very clear that Apple uh, spends only 400 US dollars on manufacturing and can capture another $600 of value add because of their intellectual property, because of their design. Uh, but the construction company or the manufacturer in this particular case only manages to capture a very, very small amount of value. And this, this helps us think about the construction industry because construction industry, when you look at the, the work done by the contractors, we are only focusing on this B portion, which is very, very small. So I think many of you are also thinking, how, how can the construction industry be changed or improved to increase its value add? Okay, so this is where this discussion comes in. Uh, I think I want to hear from you guys more about your ideas of where construction is going in Indonesia because uh, if we are operating at the $8 in $1,000 iPhone, then it's, it's not worth doing. Uh, I don't have time to show you IKEA's production system. The link is over there. If you uh, have time after my lecture, you can I'll send you the PowerPoint and you guys can have a look at it, right? So it's very similar in other manufacturing systems where the value is usually captured by the owner of the brand and not by the manufacturer. Okay, so let's look at, let's now look at each of the uh, actors within the construction industry. So let's look at clients. Uh, we, we talk about public clients and private clients. Public clients is usually the government in many developed economies. Uh, the role of client is usually carried out by um, Ministry of Works or a public works department, you have your Kementerian uh, Pekerjaan Umum and Perumahan Rakyat, PUPR, who does that for Indonesia. Unfortunately, unfortunately in Australia, we do not have a Ministry of Construction or a Ministry of Works. So there is no 
more design or construction capacity in many governments today. So it's all fully privatized or outsourced to private firms. If a government agency wants to build, they will then have to engage uh, either a project management company or an engineering design company to manage that for them. So my question is this, do they still have the capacity to be professional clients because they, they no longer have in-house expertise for construction, all right? Uh, another thing governments do is to smooth out demand for large infrastructure projects. Uh, governments do not generally build uh, residential buildings. They are only involved in non-residential buildings like schools, hospitals, and infrastructure projects. So they will have to plan construction activities in such a way that they smooth out demand for large projects. You do not have a spike in one particular year because that will increase your construction costs. Uh, governments also act as regulators. So will their role as a regulator also conflict with their role as a client? Because they are the ones who make the rules. Like for example, the Metro Tunnel project, uh, the cost increase is basically because they have uh, found a lot of contaminated soil and they couldn't find a place to dispose of the contaminated soil. So the contractor then said that they will have to claim uh, extra costs because of soil remediation. And that is because of government regulations that say that you have to treat the soil before you can dispose of the soil. So there is always a conflict of interest between government as a regulator and government as a client. Private clients, uh, this is quite clear. Previously, your private clients are your building developers, uh, your homeowners. In, in Australia, we have REITs or what we call A REITs, Australian Real Estate Investment Trust. These are uh, companies that will jointly uh, collect money from the public and invest in buildings that will give them a commercial return. So very often these are offices or shopping malls because when they built these buildings, they rent it out and there is revenue coming in every month or every year. The <clears throat> REITs will then collect all these revenues and distribute the uh, profits to unit holders. So that's what we call REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. <clears throat> uh, over the last 10, 15 years, we see new players coming into the market. Australian pension funds, for example, ISPT, is, uh, is a joint venture between four of the largest pension funds that have pulled together their money to invest in buildings. So they are now one of the largest investors for uh, commercial buildings in the central business district in many capital cities in Australia. Uh, from, from an Indonesian perspective, uh, you have what we call the KIK DINFRA, which is your collective investment fund that invests in infrastructure. So I believe that the, uh, your, your toll highways are now uh, parked under these collective investment trusts from uh, Jasa Marga. So you have your Jasa Marga uh, Investment Trust. And I believe many of these new ones will be coming on stream very soon. So that's another type of client where they will then be uh, driving demand for construction. Do you have any comments on this? Okay. Main contractors. So now we focus on main contractors. Now contractors in Australia are very clearly separated between building contractors and engineering contractors. So you will not find uh, contractors doing both. Even our largest contractors will be, uh, maybe land lease would do both, but most of these companies will focus on one sector uh, they will not be doing both. It's not like in Indonesia. I think in Indonesia, many of your uh, BUMN construction companies will be active in both building and engineering. But over here, 
a company like ProBuild or Multiplex are solely focused on high-rise residential in central business districts in the capital cities, uh, whereas the engineering companies like John Holland, CPB, and all that will be only focusing on infrastructure works. So there's a very clear divide. Uh, they are all very highly specialized. Some of them only built high-rise apartments. Some of them built uh, hospitals. Hospitals is a very specialized type of work. Some of them built schools. Uh, many of them are uh, specialists only for hospitals because hospitals are very, very complex type of construction work and not many contractors uh, are able to build hospitals and make profits because it's complex and very often if you're not experienced building hospitals you lose a lot of money we divide our construction companies into tiers tier one tier two tier three only tier one is formalized tier two and tier three are the smaller construction companies uh, please bear in mind that it's different from the tiers uh, in the uk definition the British definition is that the tier one is the main contractor, tier two is the subcontractor, tier three is the sub subcontractor. In Australia, uh, we don't have that similar system. We call tier one are the uh, the maybe five of the best construction of the largest construction companies. Tier two will be the next five. So generally, tier one will have a turnover of between two to four billion Australian dollars per year. Then the tier two will be about 500 million to two billion a year. And tier three will be the ones smaller than 500 million. So it's always to do with uh, turnover or revenue. And it is not quite clear where the boundaries are between tier one and tier two. So some of the companies will self-declare that I am a tier one construction company, uh, even though we think that they are in tier two. So there is no official information on who is tier one and who is tier two. Subcontractors. Now, I mentioned previously that many of the main contractors do not actually carry out construction work. All the work is carried out by subcontractors. So the main contractors generally only manage the construction contracts. They will have their own project managers. They will have construction managers. They will have site managers. They manage occupational health and safety. They have uh, planners and programmers to work on the schedules. But they, they, they engage no construction workers. So all the construction workers will work for subcontractors. So what I've shown you over here is uh, one of the largest subcontractors. So Form 700 is, uh, is a large concrete subcontractor. All right. So they focus solely on concrete. They, so the, some of their roles are listed over here. So if you look at the uh, on their website, they will tell you what they do. They supply and erect form work. They supply and fix reinforcing bars. They supply, pump, place, and finish the concrete. They also sometimes supply the self-climbing form for the core, and uh, they supply the perimeter fencing. You can see that all the tall buildings we built needs to have a perimeter fence as the building goes up to prevent uh, workers and tools from falling down onto the uh, lower levels of the building. So that's a perimeter safety screening. They also supply reinforcing bars for the raking columns. The raking columns are the one you see over here, right? The ones that are slanted out that way. They also supply and pump concrete. So that's generally what the subcontractors do. The subcontractors are actually very, very large companies and are able to uh, handle the entire scope of all the concreting works. Mm. 
Then you then come to uh, trade subcontractors. So these are the ones that are very highly specialized in a particular trade. So what I'm going to show you is uh, this little video of uh, a plumbing company that we worked with back in 2017, 2018, uh, where they started to prefabricate plumbing. So what they've done is, uh, or let me show you the video, then we can discuss whether you think it's a, it's a, it's an interesting uh, system. Wait, let me let me share the sound. Uh, video, where's the sound? Share computer sound. Okay. Is is my microphone working? Yes, sir. It's okay because I got a message from Pak Wawan that uh, is so everything's working right. Okay, I'll let me know if something's not working. Okay, this is eight eight three drain. This is how we want them to come out from the factory. The only issue we've got is the configuration of the clip on site. But the whole idea, even though this is not. The case, we put this, we put this up. So, so you know, I'm thinking that this is the drain. I That's a place. Okay, what do you guys think? So what he has done is uh, this is a, a plumbing company and only licensed plumbers are allowed to install plumbing, piping and fixtures on the construction site. So what they've done is to carry out prefabricated plumbing and he has just demonstrated that it is possible to prefabricate uh, the whole section of waste pipes and install that in less than one minute. Now, this is, actually, this is not really true because we practice this at his factory for maybe two hours before he could do it in one minute. But the plan was that it's possible to prefabricate all the plumbing pieces. It will be cut in the factory many of these pieces will be jointed in the factory and then delivered to a construction site and erected very, very quickly. So some of our trade subcontractors uh, are again very highly skilled, uh, specialized and are able to also uh, improve on construction processes. Are there any questions about this? Any questions about this? Sir? Yes. Is the material is from them too? The material, the, the yes, pipe yes. is from the, them too? Or, the or pipe just is also the... from the plumber, yes. Sir, in this yes. case, is it captured in manufacture, not in construction? Ah, yes. So this will be captured in manufacturing, correct? <laughs> So you now begin to question your construction productivity numbers. If you look at construction productivity, uh, the productivity improvement of moving from the site to the factory is not captured in construction. It is captured in manufacturing. So you can see that manufacturing gets better, but construction is st still unproductive because this still has to be installed at the construction site. So the, it's, it's to do with the definition. That's why I always start the construction economics course with definitions. The statistics department or the industrial classification classifies construction wrongly. 
all right all the improvements are put into manufacturing all the difficult tasks that cannot be improved remains in construction so i don't understand what can we do uh, i hope when you guys devise a better system in indonesia then we follow indonesia what do you think pak budi <laughs> Yeah, it's our homework. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we we buy. So this is another subcontractor, uh, curtain wall, and it's quite interesting that we have no curtain wall manufacturer here in Australia, and we buy most of our curtain wall from Asia. Uh, the number one supplier of curtain wall is China. This is quite an interesting company. They are in Malaysia. So they are they supplied the curtain wall components to a, an apartment here in Melbourne. So that's that's what I'm trying to say that many of the construction materials are no longer available in Australia, and we have to subcontract that to manufacturers or suppliers in uh, lower cost, lower production cost countries in Asia. So that that's another thing for you guys to think about. Uh, your labor cost is a lot cheaper in Indonesia. So if you can think of an idea where uh, Indonesia can offer some of these products and services to Australia, you will be able to make a lot of money. So where do we? Where does the main contractor find subcontractors? So number one. They will have their own network of subcontractors, subcontractors that they work with regularly, and uh, there's also a system here in the local newspapers, where so this is an example of uh, the Herald Sun. Herald Sun is a local newspaper, and they will advertise in the local newspaper, like so. Chavello is uh, is a contractor, so they are asking. So if you look very carefully at this. This is the main contractor, and they are asking for subcontractors and suppliers pricing for these three projects. So there are three projects that they are bidding for. They are asking subcontractors, for example, electrician, plumbers, uh, concreters, and all the other subcontractors who are pricing for these projects to also send them their quotes. All right, so it is a very competitive environment where everything is almost transparent in the sense that subcontractors uh, submitting prices to these three projects have been requested to submit the same quotes to this construction company. So it it appears in the newspapers every week. Uh, it saves them a lot of work because if company A is, for example, preparing a quote for the Boeing job, you can send the same quotation to all the main contractors that are bidding for that job. So it becomes a very competitive market. This was today. I went online today and you can see that if you are interested to work on this project with Fulton Hogan. They are looking to engage one or more contractors on the railway car park construction project. And you have to email this person by the 16th of February, 2021. So that's in two weeks time. So if you're interested in this particular project, you can uh, submit your prices or you can submit your expression of interest to this particular company. So all that information is uh, freely available online. We have a, a very competitive construction market and that basically brings down the construction cost. So is it good or is it bad? I think it's bad because then the profit margins are reduced, but it becomes a very efficient construction industry. What do you think, Pabudi? Is it good or is it bad? Good for a client. Yeah, good for client. Yes, good for client, but bad for the industry because clients <laughs> are not considered part of the construction industry. I think, I think this very 
very interesting pak pak Tiki because if one one subcontractor can apply openly and everyone can see that they apply to many many contractor mm. because this is not common in Indonesia I think because uh, in Indonesia mostly one subcontractor they only dedicated with one uh, main contractor mm. and before they submitted the the quotation uh, they have uh, signed the MOU like MOU that they only uh, they agreed to support only one uh, main contractor mm. so yeah so Uh, and they, they cannot uh, support to another contractor. And in Indonesia, we also, uh, if one subcontractor, they uh, like uh, uh, submit to 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 many many uh, contractor. Uh, the client will like will disqualify the the contractor okay why because, will the yeah. client disqualify yes because uh, the term of contract condition in in the tender the main contractor have to and that uh, have to support by specialist uh, subcontractor in mostly in in a big project like ptpp uh, have to support with a specific specialist uh, contractor so uh, if uh, one specialist contractor they uh, submit to uh, uh, maybe vijaya karyan that's uh, uh, f- uh, did the same uh, project uh, In Indonesia, it's not common. Not common, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think it's it's a it's a different system, and I it it encourages students to think about whether it's. Uh, I, I'm basically showing you an alternative method of contracting. I'm not saying it's better. I I leave it up to you to think if this is better, whether it will work in Indonesia or, you know, it's it's interesting. I I just want you guys to think that there are other ways of doing subcontracting. There is no, there is no correct answer. <laughs> right? There is no correct answer. Uh, okay, there are other companies who do different things. Uh, the the latest trend is into prefabrication. So, this company Hickory in Melbourne is now prefabricating a large proportion of the building work. So if you look at this picture over here, uh, some of you may have already seen this video because I gave a presentation for Pak Krishna's class uh, where they compared the Hickory Building Solution, HBS, 22 people on a three-day cycle. That means they, they can complete one story in three days, whereas the conventional system will need 50 people on a five-day cycle. So this is very very productive. Okay, now if you look very carefully, uh, most of the components are prefabricated. So if you look at this piece over here, on the bottom right corner, so that whole panel is prefabricated. You can see the uh, connections between panel A and panel B, right? If you call that panel A. You call that panel B. You can see that there are connectors between A and B, uh, and then there are braces. So these are the props to prevent the wall from falling down, which I'm showing you in green, right? So these are the props to hold the wall up. Uh, there's a crane that there's a tower crane out here. I think that's the tower crane. Uh, I think I better change back to red. It's a lot easier to see if it's in red. There's a tower crane out there. Now, what else do you see? 
all the walls are precast, all the floor slab is precast. What do you think are these black boxes? Can you see them? Is that a bathroom, sir? Yes, that's the bathroom. So this is a hotel project and every room will have a bathroom. The bathrooms are all prefabricated. So day one, they put in the, <coughs> the floor and put in the props. And then in the next day or two, they put in the bathrooms and it's very, very fast. I'll show you the video afterwards, okay? Uh, so that's the bathroom. The bathrooms are all prefabricated as well. So this is the, the prefabricated uh, concrete slab and wall. So they have put in the curtain wall and concrete slab as one unit. So if you look very carefully, these are the, that's the slab. Okay. This is the curtain wall. And these are the supports for the upper floor. So you can then stack your panels up one above the other. Okay, so this is a two and a half, a uh, two minutes 46 second video. Uh, I will show you how that works and then you can ask questions. Number one priority. One of the key benefits of this modern method of construction is the pre-installed facade eliminates live edge work. We don't have formwork screens and other inherently risky tasks. And the facade when installed in the factory is a safer process done at ground level than being done up in the air. Our next key priority on site is quality and the quality that we're able to achieve with our pre-finished concrete floors and pre-installed facades exceeds what we can traditionally achieve on site. Another key benefit of this construction method is a reduction in waste. We don't have concrete pumping on site, so we don't have concrete blowback and we don't have leftover steel because everything comes in the exact quantities that we need. Our floor cycles continued at approximately three days of floor with the windows installed by bringing larger components to site with pre-installed elements, we greatly reduce the amount of construction traffic on the roads in and around sites, which is a benefit to not only the projects, but also to our neighbours and the councils that we work in. Our prefabricated bathroom pods set new benchmarks in quality and eliminate a lot of reworks on site. A key part of Hickory's vision is to industrialise and improve the construction process so that we can get tangible improvements in the key metrics of safety, time, cost and quality when it comes to building our buildings. The method that we've used here, which utilises our HBS technology along with our bathroom pods, talks directly to all the self-performed disciplines that we've been working so hard on over the last 11 or 12 years in our business. Okay, what do you guys think? What do you guys think about this system? Does it work? Does it work for you? Okay, so these are the bathroom pots. Uh, remember I said that the, the ones that are wrapped in black plastic, so these are prefabricated uh, as one unit. So it's got a concrete floor. It has uh, steel studs as the wall panels, insulation, and it's all wrapped up, ready to go. It has all the tiles put in, all the bathroom fixtures put in, all the plumbing put in, all the electrical put in, the mirror is in, the uh, vanity cabinet is in, so everything is pre-installed. All they have to do is use a crane, pick this up and put it into its final location. So again, this is very quickly a video on how that's manufactured and uh, brought to the site.
I think this one doesn't have sound. So that's prefabricated at the factory. Use the crane, pick it up. So notice that it's picked up from the bottom because the, the walls are not sufficiently strong to sustain the weight of the entire bathroom, right? So the structural component is at the bottom. They have to pick it up from the bottom. Using the towel crane, shoo, goes up and then delivered to the edge of a building. There's a platform out there, I think, where it goes onto the building. So there are different systems, different, different bathroom pots. Some of them are, so this one is coming in through the side of the building. It is then wheeled into position. Some of them are craned directly into position. So that's the lifting structure. They are now using a pallet truck and moving it in. Check that it's got enough headroom clearance. And put it to its final position. So this is how it looks after the uh, wrapping protective uh, plastic is removed. So it's got the door, it's got insulation, it's got steel studs. Okay, so that's bathroom pods. So if you look at the information given by the contractor, they're basically saying that uh, they've done comparisons of uh, four building projects that they complete recently. Uh, they're claiming that they can shorten the schedule from uh, in this particular project from, oops, sorry, 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 uh, from 27 months to 19 months, 26 months to 18 months, from 40 months to 29, from 17 to 11. So they do have a system where they can uh, erect high rise construction very, very quickly. And it, it, it works. Okay. So I, I have former students who are working on projects like this and it's really, really quick. So that, that's what we call the, or they call the Hickory building solution. Uh, about 10 years ago, they were experimenting with totally prefabricated boxes. So it was a box like this. So this was technology 10 years ago, but it did not really work out. Okay, it was not as efficient as the current system. These boxes uh, were what we what they call unitized building and it needed additional vertical load carrying members over here can you see them and uh, you can also see steel members uh, acting as the floor plate so this ended up being a lot more expensive than the concrete system that they are currently using now so they've experimented, they've come up with uh, what they think is a very efficient system today. So the Hickory building solution that I've just shown you is what we are currently uh, using in Melbourne today. The late, so the latest iteration is to use the uh, Hickory building solution, the one with the, the floor slab and the curtain wall, plus the sink bathroom pots. And the information we have is that the bathroom pots are partially manufactured in China. And that is to take advantage of the lower production cost in Asia compared to Australia. Okay, finance. Now, uh, <clears throat> when I showed you the slide about of the tier one construction companies, I also listed who owns those companies. Many of our 
Australian construction companies are owned by international contractors. So recently, Kajima bought uh, Icon and Cochrane. So two of our Australian construction companies were bought up by Kajima. And as you know, the name Kajima, it tells you that they are from Japan. So why do you think Kajima bought two of the Australian construction companies? Or alternatively, why did the Australian construction companies need to have a Japanese partner? Why did they choose to sell to Kajima? What do you think is happening here? Any suggestions? So the clues can be obtained over here. Uh, capability to deliver projects of any size, any scale, anywhere. Uh, with the backing of the Japanese contractor, the Australian companies today are now able to take on larger projects. Okay, they, they keep needing to grow large to be able to bid for much larger projects. And as you have seen, uh, many of the projects these days are getting more complex, uh, tall buildings, super tall towers, and they need lots of investment to come into Australia uh, to help these firms grow. So they are they estimated 2020 turnover for ICON is now $1.7 billion. So these companies are growing very fast and they really need additional cash to help them grow. Uh, the unfortunate thing was that on the 12th of January, 2021, so this was just a month ago, uh, ProBuild, which is uh, one of the uh, largest contractors over here, they are currently owned by South African company. Uh, they were There was a bid by a Chinese construction firm, China State Construction Engineering Corporation, CSCEC, that wanted to buy ProBuild, but that was blocked by the Australian government on the 12th of January this year. So that's that's something that uh, we've all been watching very closely. Uh, they, they, the government claims that we should not sell ProBuild because of national security interests, uh, but who knows? It is already owned by the South Africans. So it's quite strange that the government allows the South African company to own one of the largest Australian firms, but not allow that firm to be sold to the Chinese. All right. Another point I want to talk about is uh, globalization. Uh, as I've mentioned to you previously, the uh, proportion of manufacturing by the large economies have dropped. The proportion of manufacturing by China has gone up. So we in Australia are losing a lot of our manufacturing sectors. And the government is now putting in uh, what we call uh, the local jobs first policy, or it's an, it's an act of parliament, local jobs first act. And that act basically says that there must be a minimum local content for public projects. And projects must also produce jobs and training opportunities for apprentices, for trainees and for cadets. So I got this information from their latest annual report. So during the last financial year, 335 projects were covered by the local jobs first policy. Uh, they have created nearly 7,000 new jobs. Uh, this is an important figure, 90% local content. So the idea here is to ensure that if, uh, if the project is $100 million, at least 90% of that $100 million is uh, spent in Australia. So we are now feeling a lot more nationalistic and the government is putting in policies that are now uh, supporting local jobs and supporting local manufacturers. So this is again, uh, something that's that's new, that's happening today. Uh, it, it, it has happened a lot during President Trump's 
time in America where he, he was trying to bring in jobs uh, that were offshore to Asia back into America. And uh, if you read the news, you'll see that President Biden is also trying to do the same thing. The global trade has changed the geopolitical dynamics of Asia and many of the developing countries have to think of uh, an appropriate response to uh, global trade. Okay, so that's something for us to discuss if we have time after this. Uh, regulations, we have uh, very stringent work regulations and we have trade unions uh, representing the workers in the construction sector. So the construction, forestry, maritime, mining and energy union, CFMEU. It should be CFMMEU, but they miss out one M. Uh, they represent 30,000 construction workers. They are very powerful. They're very active. And uh, the objective is to protect lives by upholding health and safety standards. They are the ones that really uh, enforce a lot of the health and safety rules on construction sites. Construction sites, as you know, is a very dangerous place to work. So having the union being uh, proactively campaigning for additional safety measures, additional PPE and all that actually improves the safety on construction site. Uh, they also fight for fair wages and work conditions. But unfortunately, sometimes you can also see pictures like this where the unions are testing against the employers and causes large disruptions to the construction industry. So that's something we have to deal with in Australia. I think it's not so much of a problem in Indonesia, but uh, I'm just showing you this, putting this out there because it will also impact how your industry develops and whether you think unions are necessary or whether you think the benefits of having trade unions are useful. Uh, okay, so I'm coming to the end of my presentation now. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that it's, uh, it's extremely competitive, the construction industry in Australia. Uh, we're always looking for ways to save costs, uh, shorten the schedule, uh, trying to look for cheaper places to buy products. So that often includes buying imported materials. Uh, some of the companies are thinking about prefabrication. You know, can we uh, shift some of the work from on-site to the factory because the factory workers do not need to be paid as much as the workers on site. Uh, you can control your environment in a, in a factory floor so you can get more productivity. Uh, there's also issues of uh, con procurement whether we run, we go with PPPs, uh, whether it's now funded by REITs. So you will see that the forces of how the developers work has changed slightly. Uh, many of the projects are now funded using REITs rather than just by the developers. And in Indonesia, you have uh, your collective investment trust, which may uh, change the way projects are financed. Uh, now, those of you who are interested, I would suggest that you can also look at how large construction companies fail. Uh, Carillion in the UK was a very uh, spectacular failure. It was uh, one of the preferred contractors by the government. The government continued to give them projects even though they were in financial distress, uh, but eventually the company failed. So the government was blamed for uh, giving Carillion lots of projects, even though they were at the brink of failure. Uh, Metro Tunnel, environmental risk. This is what I've told you earlier. The government put in very stringent rules on uh, the waste material that it has to be treated. Uh, it has to be uh, stabilized before you can dispose, but the government did not identify where they can dispose or, and that caused uh, a huge cost overrun. Now, uh, we've seen how the uh, a modern construction industry operates here in Australia. So my question is, uh, are there people that is 
that are looking at disrupting the entire construction supply chain or and making it a bit more closer or a bit more reflective of the manufacturing sector because they think that the construction manufacturing a construction production system is not so efficient uh, is it possible to look for another system that can work so let me just share this video with you let's have a quick look at katera uh, it's a three minute video we've assembled a team of people that that are used to operating in a very different environment with very different different disciplines there's a lot of people out of the technology industry who are bringing the tools into industries that typically have not had a lot of technology and that's certainly the case in the construction industry so I came from a background in the electronics industry. Um, all the previous companies that I've worked for have been um, somewhere in the electronic supply chain. So companies like Apple, Motorola, EMC. The building industry today in the supply chain is a disaggregated industry. Um, you have a general contractor who depends on subcontractors to order the materials. The subcontractors go to distribution who then order the materials. And then finally those distributors buy the product. And in today's world where you're your developer is so far away from that supplier and what they're doing. One, it's costly, so it costs a lot of money, and number two is it's slow. We want to take all that out. We have our partners that are up front, our designers that work for Katera, that are working with our development partners, and they are talking directly to our uh, suppliers in Asia, Mexico, and the U.S. We are able to move very fast to be able to move these new ideas back into the supply chain and then get those materials and use them in our business. What we are doing is using technology to optimize for supply chain, to optimize for design, and optimize for manufacturing, and, and then also optimize for the construction side. This is applying technology all throughout this chain. So when we think about the changes we need to make, bringing these ideas from the electronics industry over to the, uh, the construction industry, you know, one of the big things is really just the category management. Um, you know, within the construction industry, general contractors and subcontractors have no direct relationship with the suppliers. Right? It's all going through a distribution in another level before they see it. We firmly believe that having you know, ourselves embedded with them in their factories, understanding what causes quality problems and cost issues with them, we can then work with them to drive those costs out. If they're involved in that process, we can work together to, to reduce costs. We don't want to bring in 10 guys and keep bidding them off of each other. We want to bring in one or two suppliers in every area, have them work with us on the design, get them up to be the best supplier in the world, and then we'll both go work together to be successful. You know, one of our commitments to our partners is once you're on board and we're, we're that category is being bought by Katera, then they will get the benefit of that volume. Our first step will be to build a quality and the most beautiful building we possibly can. But then I firmly believe we can do it faster. I firmly believe we can do it cheaper. And so this might be the first time that we can actually do all three of those things. And you know what? It's our customer at the end of the day, the people that need homes, the people who need affordable housing, they get the benefit of us doing that. So it's a pretty exciting time. Okay, uh, I think that is my last slide. Ah, no, that's, this is none. This is a continuation of what the plumbers did. Okay, let me just very quickly share what that, let you watch this video. So you can see the top, the top track of this wall and that wall that they touched out to suit the pipe over there.
Okay, uh, I think I need to explain that this is this video was taken by me, so it's not professionally done. Uh, but what they've done here is uh, to prefabricate the wall plus the plumbing system. So you can see that at the start of the video, they were bringing in the prefabricated wall panel. It had the shower mixer, it had the hot and cold water pipes already pre-installed in the wall. So that uh, will make the, that's, that's the innovation that they were thinking of doing, where the wall manufacturer and the plumber works together, very similar in the way that IKEA makes furniture. So they were thinking that they could sell this to uh, other construction companies and use this in a very flexible way because you can have different walls uh, as opposed to a prefabricated bathroom pot. The pot is not so flexible because you have to design the entire pot as, as one, whereas this is a lot more flexible. Okay, I think that ends my presentation and give you time for questions. Uh, yes, questions. So that's, that's, that's all from me. Any questions? Sure. Yes. Oh, I want to ask about uh, the, the tier, the contractor tier that you already yes. explained before. There are yes. three, the tier one, tier two, and tier three, right? Uh, and yes. uh, divided based on the income throughout the year. Mm. Uh, uh, what is the purpose of the, the categorizations of the, the tier? Is there any regulation to divide the construction no. market in, in, in no, Australia? No. Or? no, there is no, we don't have your classification like you have in Indonesia of uh, hmm. besar, menengah, and kecil. Uh, yeah. We just use tier one, tier two, tier three. Uh, everybody acknowledges that the largest five are tier one. The next five is tier two and uh, everybody else is tier three. Because so there are... the, the industry is not, there is no real need to regulate the industry. The industry is self-regulating. So we do not have an LPJK. We do not have a PUPR. Um, so the, the, in here in Indonesia, we have the classification so that the, the big contractor will only uh, do the, the big project like that. But in Australia, so the, the big contractor will, uh, can do the, the small project too. Yes. Yes. Oh. They can, they can, but it will not be economical because the big contractor has a very high overhead cost. So their prices will not be competitive. And uh, because most of the projects are private clients, the government cannot control whether they can bid for what value of projects because the, the clients are always private. In Indonesia, your clients are very often government. So they can control using regulations that the, the uh, classification of large contractor can bid for this size project, uh, classification for medium sized contractor can bid for that size project. But over here, it's all private. So it's an open market. If a large contractor were to bid for a small job, it will be terribly expensive. Oh, okay. okay. So the market decides. Okay. Are there other questions? Yes, all very good questions. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, does Australia have a specific 
tendering system. Like for example, in Indonesia, we use a, a dua sampul. Do you know dua sampul? Dua, dua sampul, sampul is, yes. Yeah, so one sampul. technical, one commercial. Yeah, administration and technical after a contractor pass in the sampul one, they uh, will then submit the commercial. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, we 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 do and we don't. Uh, there, as I've mentioned to Andira, that there is it's it's private sector. So very often they will uh, invite contractors to bid. So we try not to have too many contractors bidding for the same job because it is it is a waste of resources if they do not win. So very often they will shortlist to about three contractors to go into the final round of bidding. Because if you get 10 contractors to bid, nine of their bidding process is wasted. So if you only have three, then at least you know that only two will be wasted. Does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> So there is always something like a pre-qualification before, uh, before they they ask for bids. Pre, pre uh, you mean pre qualification pre qualification is same with the uh, dua sample in Indonesia? No, no, no. It's not. We, I, I don't think the private sector does dua sample. Hmm. They, they, they do the first sample, the, the technical, by inviting only those that they think are qualified to bid. Mm. And so that eliminates the first, first sample, right? Yeah. And all tender is open tender. Uh, <laughs> <known> in, uh... <laughs> Not necessarily, because this is uh, many of the projects are private sector projects. Private sector projects there is no law to say that it has to be uh, transparent tender. You can still give it to your to your kawan kawan. Okay, it's well, mean uh, it's a private it's mean, project, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. you can do anything you want. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's but it's mean you, uh, the marketing team like Indonesia still needed in Australia. Yeah. Mm. Kedekat, kedekatan dengan kawan-kawan still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kedekatan dengan kawan-kawan is very important, yes. Okay, uh, Pak. Thank you. Yes. Fitria, uh, I have can hear your voice. Back to your material last week among the tech. Which infrastructure do you... So I'm responding to a chat question by Fitria. Uh, which type of infrastructure do you think can accelerate economic recovery after COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, <clears throat> I will show you how to calculate this in either next week or the following week. So I will teach you how to answer this question. Okay, so I will not answer the question now. Uh, please remind me that uh, to highlight this next week or the following week. It is better that I show you how this is done than to just tell you the answer. Okay, good. <laughs> Any other questions? Sir, back to uh, the slide, uh, the Victoria Tunnel project, that the project suffers uh, Three billion cost overrun. Yes, yes. Yeah, the it's interesting uh, because you uh, you provide the details about the the contracts. Mm, mm. So the government uh, uh, breakdowns into break down this project into several work package, uh, but only. Uh, the work package that has uh, uh, 
has you know, we, uh, we, tendency we, to yeah. make 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 uh, revenue mm. that uh, uh, goes to uh, PPP. Yes. But in Indonesia, the the government didn't split didn't, uh, split the project into small work packages. They uh, they uh, one big project. Yes, I know. They bind it into one big project, and then <laughs> the the yeah yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know because the 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 first time I I see this uh, this 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 slide. Uh, and then uh, I thought that uh, it will be a, a resulting uh, a cost uh, res reduction or cost uh, effective, but in fact it's uh, it suffers a cost overrun. Uh, but you said that the, the 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 main reason behind this is the uh, the the soil conditions. Uh, but uh, if you split the, the project into this kind of uh, work package, uh, the, the 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 executor, the the the, the entity that involved have to coordinate uh, each other in terms of design and uh, others. Uh, but if you put uh, them under one uh, entity, one one uh, PPP scheme. So they will walk around for that issues. Yes, but the the issue is directly linked to government regulation. Mm, okay. So at the end of the day, whether it is one PPP project consortium or many different project consortium they will still come back to the government because it is government regulation that causes them to lose money. Okay. Right? There is no place to throw the waste. Yeah. There is no allocation to treat the waste. And most of the project assumptions were given by the government. Okay. So the government said that the volume of soil to be remediated is maybe... Uh, 10, cubic, 10 million cubic meters. But when they actually dig the soil up, there is, uh, you know, 30 million cubic meters. So it must, they are following the contract. They say that the government estimated 10 million cubic meters, but upon running the contract, it is found to be 30 million cubic meters. Now, who who is responsible for the error? Mm, okay. So at the end of the day, they 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 are claiming from the government to say that your assumption was 10, but the reality was 30. And now there is no space to put the soil. <laughs> so it's purely because of the, 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 the soil. Yes. Not, uh, not because yeah, of the, the, the scheme. Yeah, nothing wrong with the scheme, but there is uh, there are other technical issues, of course, but this is the main one. So, can we go back to the previous slide? I mean, the slide before, the slide 20. Yes, uh, so the tunnel and station, they, they, they delivered in uh, PPP method. PPP, yes. Uh, under the PPP. Uh, so, the, uh, yeah, because in Indonesia, the the whole project is in under PPP scheme. And then the, the the entity receive uh, revenue from the tickets. Mm. Then also the the uh, the uh, shops uh, in the stations. But mm. here uh, the PPP only receive uh, revenue generate revenue from the station. I think. Not from uh, the selling ticket because yeah, yeah, the yeah, rail no. infrastructure then the, the other uh, mm. components of the projects are under different scheme. Correct, correct. So the tunnel and station is an availability payment. So it is not based on demand. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, Have you uh, ever compared this in the, the, the scheme in Indonesia? And, uh, and I do not. I mean, 
enough information about your PPP scheme in Indonesia? Which project are you talking about? Are you talking about the Kereta Cepat or are you talking about other PPP projects? The Kereta Cepat, then the uh, the MRT. Uh-huh. Uh, well, we, we, we can have a discussion about this separately because I am very interested to look at either the Kereta Cepat PPP or the uh, MRT as well to see how they can break even because if you look at Kereta Cepat, I don't think that the ticket sales will be enough to pay off the loan. So it must be the TOD that will help pay the loans, right? Yes, uh, it's also good. Uh, I mean, the, the, the scenario is also uh, uh, used by uh, Adikarya in their project of LRT. LRT. Okay. So they they, they uh, eyeing the uh, the development of the station, the area uh, yeah, around the station. The area around the station. So it's always TOD because TOD. Uh, the, the moment you build the station, the land value around the yeah, will station increase. will increase. Yes. 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 But that is very risky. Yes. So that is the only way that uh, the consortium can make money. Otherwise, I think when I looked at your financial projections for Kereta Cepat, uh, Jakarta Bandung, it's ticket revenue enough. It's not enough. Yeah. But okay. is, is there information available? Can you find the TOD financial projections? How many hectares are given to the consortium? and what they can how they can develop the tod i think we can get that information because uh, some of the uh, the executive are from itb ah, then we, we have we have links some links uh, i mean or pak pa krishna pak imo or pak abdo even have links to the, the project Okay, okay. Do you have students who are willing to investigate all this? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, because then you need students to be able to help us uh, process the numbers. Yes. Uh, okay, the the you. links are available, but Budi, so I have given you the links over here, the details of the Metro Tunnel. It's uh, This is the link of where I get the project delivery method and then the cost overrun is over here. Okay, I will send you the PowerPoint afterwards. Thank you, sir. Okay, any other questions, especially from the students? Any other questions, students? Uh, I want to ask, uh, sir. Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, regarding to our <clears throat> uh, discussion last week that uh, the, the value added is mm -hmm. defined by the profit with the uh, construction labor costs. So when we uh, go to the manufactured construction, it means that the value of construction is uh, decreasing or what we should do about this? Uh, uh, are we accept this or uh, what we can do? Thank you. Uh, in Australia, based on our definition of construction, the value add for construction will reduce. Correct. In Indonesia, I don't know. You have to ask Pak Budi and Pak Wawan. They are looking at how to define value add for Indonesian construction. So it all depends on how your country define construction. In Australia, the construction value add will drop. Yes, agreed. Uh, but uh, how about the change? Is there is uh, more better or what for, for the construction sector? In, in your case, in, in Australia? Uh, okay. It, it, it depends on whose perspective. You see, you in Indonesia, you have a Kementerian Pekerjaan Umum. We do not have 
a ministry for construction. So who cares? Nobody cares whether it is more productive or less productive. If you are a contractor, you are only interested in making profits. Okay, you are not interested in productivity. You are only interested in profits. So I think there are maybe five people in the whole of Australia looking at construction productivity. And I am one of them because nobody else needs to know. <laughs> Can you see the problem here? Whereas for you, you have PUPR who is uh, looking at productivity, looking at output, looking at value add. And you have PUPR looking at industry development. We don't have anyone looking at industry development because it is all privately driven. It is market driven. Even like as Pak Wawan was asking me, you know, is there transparency in the tender process? I say, no, you do not even need transparency in the tender process because it's all market. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you, sir. But uh, how about the the effect for the labor? Because the construction labor may be decreasing because the manufactured construction like this. How are, how how the effect uh, for for your country about this this issue? Because this is the sensitive issue for for the people. Thank you. Uh, yes, we we have we do not have enough construction workers because the younger people do not want to work in construction. All of them want to be construction manager. They don't want to be worker or skilled worker. Okay. So by moving a lot of the work into the factory, it is actually good because we have a shortage of skilled workers. Does that answer your question? We have a shortage of skilled workers. So by shifting everything into the uh, manufacturing, it's it's okay. Well, so it's more uh, efficient because uh, maybe the, the definition of the workers between us is different, like you, you said. So the, there is... Uh, the difference between uh, Indonesia and Australia of, of the definition of the workers? Uh, yes, we, we do not have unskilled worker because our workers sometimes get paid more than university lecturers. I think I told you guys before, right? The uh, A licensed plumber on a construction site is paid more than a university academic. So some, sometimes I think with Pak Budi, I was joking. I say, maybe when I, uh, if I don't want to teach at the university, I will go and become a plumber. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> no, they, 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 they actually make a lot of money. So it's, it's, uh, it's a good, good industry to be in if you are young and hardworking. Okay, any other questions? Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, I'm just want to asking the last week topic about construction value. Mm -hmm. uh, can we calculate or modeling some equation that show showing to we about uh, effect construction value to construction employment? Uh, yes. Yes. We can. And so I will show you that next week. Oh. All the mathematics okay. that come next week. Okay, okay. Thank you. You guys are all very good, very, very keen to learn. Asking questions before I show you the, the method. <laughs> okay, Pak Budi, anything else? Uh, yes, one question that it may be out of context. I mean, this, this session's context, uh, but uh, uh, might, might relate to one of the, 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 the slide that you shown us. Uh, 
I, I learned that uh, in the past uh, when we are when we were in uh, Dutch uh, colonization, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, there were several infrastructure projects that funded by uh, private. Uh, for example, the railway uh, uh, railway uh, links uh, in Java, some part of Java, because uh, in the past, I think I don't know the 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 the, the Dutch uh, government uh, endorsed the, the 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 private to involve in the public uh, infrastructure investment. Mm -hmm. uh, but it the 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 situation changed you know, uh, when we uh, got our independence. Uh, the government uh, tried to uh, cover all the uh, infrastructure project under uh, uh, their uh, funding their fund. I think so, you. Can you told me that it is part of your undang-undang, right? That infrastructure, public infrastructure must be provided by pemerintah and not by swasta. Yes, but, but in the early of the uh, the republic, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the government has still has uh, uh, enough fund and not much, not many area to be developed. <laughs> but uh, in recent years, so the government kind of uh, not enough money. Not enough money to to, to build the, the the infrastructure. So they involve uh, they uh, attract uh, the investor to participate in the uh, providing the mm. infrastructure. So, uh, but uh, in Australia. It's. I, I think in the uh, second uh, session you showed that uh, in Australia uh, the 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 trend is different. I mean, the situation is different. The the, the right. government only government has little only project. Schools and hospital, and even now, uh, hospital can be PPP. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, what what do you think about the, this situation in Indonesia? I mean, is it uh, someday that the government uh, has less uh, uh, not not less concern, but less uh, involvement in the uh, public infrastructure project? I but think towards that to uh, private. I think that is the direction Indonesia should take. That you will have to involve private money into infrastructure development. But the issue is that you have to choose the projects very carefully, projects that can make money, projects that have uh, revenue can be privatized, projects that cannot make money, like schools, must still be delivered by the government. So. Like schools, you, you, you can never make money from schools. School is very clearly government. But I think infrastructure like uh, roads, like railway, uh, like uh, sometimes hospital, sometimes prisons, all that can be PPP. And you then have a bigger source of funding for your infrastructure. Every country will have will face the same problem no government has enough money to develop the country so you have to use private money somewhere and private money must be used in only in areas where they, they the private sector can see a clear return on investment if there is no return on investment then the cost will be too high Okay, sir. Yes, uh, because in uh, based on my observations, there are some projects that uh, normally the the, the uh, uh, public projects uh, has problem with the uh, land acquisition. Yes. Uh, but 
when it comes to uh, the private that uh, handles the land acquisition, uh, uh, it has some tendency to uh, it's much faster because they can pay uh, without uh, some uh, land administration, some land bureaucracy. So it's uh, faster to do uh, is because uh, government sometimes they have some barriers, they have some regulation that to follow to comply. But uh, the 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 private one, they they, they just can buy. The, <laughs> they the, just buy. Yes, yes. They just buy it. Mm. Correct. I think I think uh, there's a lot of things that can be improved in Indonesia. So. It's a good time to be involved in construction research. Yes, uh, but the, the, some problem, normally the problem is in the uh, social uh, conflict mm -hmm. that cannot be handled by the private one. Okay, thank you. Sir. Okay, very good. So, any other questions? If not, we can... Uh, Pabudi, can we end here if there are no more questions? Uh, ya, yeah. ada yang mau bertanya lagi? Uh, if not, I think uh, maybe we, uh, Pak Tike will uh, could share some insight about uh, next sessions, what we will be covering, what we will be covering in the next sessions. Okay, next session, I will be talking about input-output tables. So... Uh, it would be useful if you all have your computers with you. All right, so I'm going to be sharing uh, uh, an Excel, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, and I will be showing you how to manipulate uh, economic data to work out uh, exactly what Fitria was asking. How do you accelerate economic development? Uh, what are the multipliers? What are the uh, one extra rupiah spent in construction will then stimulate your Indonesian economy by uh, how much more or how many more rupiah. So I think I will be able to show you all that starting next week. And if you bring a computer, so make sure that you are not joining the Zoom session uh, on your phone, but on your computer, uh, make sure that it's a strong, strong internet connection and it will be uh, hands-on, right? So I need you guys to actually try some of the examples that I give you next week. Right, Pabudi? Remember, okay. we did it last year. Yes. Ah. <laughs> so do they have to download, I mean, uh, get hands-on the Excel before the class? Or oh, no, no, you I might can... be sharing during the class? I will send during the class, yes. I will share during the class, okay? Okay, thank you, sir. All right. So I so, think yeah, we can end this the session. Okay, so we'll see you next week. Uh, make sure that you got Microsoft Excel running, and I will uh, send Pak Budi extra information if necessary. Pak Wawan, why are you wearing a mask, Pak Wawan? He's in the office. He's in the office. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> Bye. Okay, thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thank you, Patike. Okay. You, thank, you. thank you, Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tike. Terima kasih, Pak Budi.